Well, good afternoon to everybody we have. We are very glad to, to receive here, give the best greetings for the friends of South Center for the launching of this book, Investment Treaties. Uh, with uh, Mr. Manuel Monte and uh, Atuka Dia Jailani, Director for Economic, Social, Cultural Treaties, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Indonesia. And our friends, Luis Carlos de Loma Prado, Carlos Medeiros, and also Carlos Correa from Ecuador. Well, we We want to say that we have the <coughs> great interest in maintaining a, a friend, a close relationship with the South Center. It's an institution to which we are linked, naturally linked. And with this book, I think we give the, uh, uh, an important step to to increase this relationship with Centro Celso Furtado. So we are very glad to, to realize this meeting here in, in our home and to give Mr. Monti the best wishes to, to the South Center in general. So I, I, I have a problem in, at home, so I will not, I, I cannot stay uh, many time, much time, but I, I want to express our, our glad, our, our satisfaction in having these friends from uh, South Center here. Mr. Manuel Monti. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Zabalini. Uh, for us, it's a very big honor to be able to launch this book uh, here in Brazil. Uh, this is our first book on investment treaties. And, uh, we have done a lot of work in countries with respect to investment treaties, but this is the first time we are able to put down on paper our uh, ideas on investment treaties. We are very happy to do it in Brazil because uh, Brazil, uh, if you don't know, it's an innovator with respect to investment treaties. Because the normal investment treaty is based on an adversarial relationship between the foreign investor and the host government. The Brazilian government is now uh, innovating about a more uh, promotion-oriented view of how this treaty should be. And of course, we uh, in the South Center, we're very conscious of all the problems that have been caused by investment treaties as they exist right now. Brazil has not signed, have, have signed a few treaties, but have not ratified any of them. Right? And therefore, they have not have any experience of actual uh, uh, dispute uh, awards that are based on commercial uh, considerations. And what has happened now is that the Brazilian society has managed to think very deeply about how to recast these treaties so that they are in our interest. Uh, I have just given uh, Professor Sotomino a new paper from the South Center, mm -hmm. uh, from our chief economist, uh, because our view is that the, the foreign investment, unless it is shaped by the state policy, is not going to have a positive impact on the economy. It can even undermine the economy. The problem is that these investment treaties are actually, uh, they reduce the ability of countries to be able to to shape the foreign investment, to choose foreign investment, because of the kinds of uh, features that they have. So we are very, 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 very honored to do it through the sales of Portado. This is the first time actually we're launching the book, right? Uh, we have given out copies of the book in the forum that we have just held here that was uh, uh, hosted by the Brazilian government. But this is the first academic launch of the book. And uh, because we are doing it with Celso Fortado, we thought it was the best way to, to do this uh, book. Uh, we are very, very much, uh, 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 we, we really think, as, as uh, the professor, professor said, that we, are, we really think that we are a kindred spirit 
with respect to the Celso Portado Institute, because for us, we believe that development is impossible without the role of the state. And in the Brazilian cosmos, uh, the Celso Portado Institute has been very important in terms of uh, uh, maintaining the, the role of the state as part of development policy, right? Uh, and being very, being very conscious of the fact that there are, uh, well, I, you know, I, I, I take some of the words, I think, from your previous president too, right? That uh, there are hierarchies in international relations. And these hierarchies actually prevent uh, many states from being able to undertake uh, development policy as they would need, right? Uh, the, uh, we have been, and this period is now ending in a very rapid way. We have been through a period in which uh, state intervention was considered a bad idea. Uh, but all through that period, Celso Fortado Institute has consistently uh, understood that, that, that this kind of thinking is based on a flawed and a, a poor theory of uh, how development actually happens. Uh, and this is why we are, we are very, very interested in doing it with the Celso Fortado Institute. We do hope that this is, we have figured out a way to begin having a, a, a physical relationship with you, and we hope that we will be able to uh, continue it in the future. Uh, and that's why we are very happy to be launching it uh, here. So let me just say uh, we are very thankful for uh, Mr. Glover for helping us organize this, and for the Celso Portano Institute for helping us uh, in this event, and of course, the professor that the are very grateful to the Institute for having us here. Thank you very much. So do you want to begin with this? Uh, yes, no, I'm going to be in this of Mr. Mr. Joy Landy. Yeah. Yeah. You should yeah. say yeah. something. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I will be very short, perhaps. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, I feel really great honor to be here, you know, to, to come in this, uh, the launching of this book. Um, I'm very, so, I'm so proud to become the, the part of the history of a sub-center because the sub-center, this, this is the first time for sub-center to publish book on investment. So this is my personal gratitude. And of course, I would also like to extend my special thank to your institute for organizing this event. I think this is a very, very important event. Um, to me, when I was the first time requested to publish, uh, to, to be one of the contributors of this book, I was so willing, I was so enthusiastic to, to part of them, because I think that this book will contribute to the collective effort by developing countries in their collective efforts to, to, to reform the international investment regime. As you know that now, nowadays, developing countries really want to try to strike a balance between the interest of the investment protection and the interest of the state in particular in pursuing their, their national policy objectives. So I think this is very important books to us and to everybody, I think, yes. yeah? And then uh, if, 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 you may see, if, if you may see that in this book, there are some salient features of experience of some developing countries that might be good for us to, to see each other, not only for Brazil, but maybe for also for other countries. And in our part, in our part, in, in, in the Indonesian part, you can see that uh, the rationale of our reviews, why we, we, we conduct the review, and then we, uh, how the review is being conducted. I'm saying it's being conducted because, because we are still in the process of review until now we, we haven't finalized yet. And then, of course, the challenge of, uh, of our review process. Yesterday we had a quite extensive discussion in the uh, International Forum for uh, Investment Negotiators we share some practical challenges that we are facing in conducting review. I think this is a very important one. Mm -hmm. And last but not least is, uh, of course, in our article, we also flesh out some substantive issues that might be useful for the readers. Mm -hmm. So I think I should stop here then. Thank you so much.
Mr. Carlos Correa wants to wishes to. Well, thank you, thank you very much also for the opportunity to uh, participate in the launch of this uh, of this book. Um, I would like to uh, present the context that explains why this book has been produced. Mm -hmm. uh, as we know, most most countries are interested in uh, getting foreign direct investment. And many countries actually promote foreign direct investment through different mechanisms, including providing tax incentives uh, or other, other measures in order to make uh, their economies attractive to uh, foreign investors. In some cases, it has been because of uh, balance of payment problems. For instance, when India liberalized its policy in relation to foreign investment, they were looking for just uh, getting capital because there was a balance of payment crisis. In other cases, the objective is to develop particular sectors, mining, agriculture, or manufacturing. So there are some national objectives that are pursued and there is the expectation that foreign capital will provide the necessary technology, the necessary resources in order to develop some particular sectors. And therefore, I would say perhaps most countries today, including for instance Brazil, is, uh, is interested in getting uh, foreign direct investment. I should have, however, indicate two caveats. The first one is that uh, not all countries have followed this approach. For instance, South Korea is very well known. South Korea, when they started this, their strong industrialization process, they, they took the deliberate decision not to allow foreign direct investment or to allow it under very restricted conditions in order to permit the emergence of local companies because their objective was to develop <coughs> national companies strong enough in order to compete internationally and as we know they were successful and in other cases uh, there have been restrictions to uh, foreign direct investment in particular sectors particular areas services uh, in, in related to uh, security or other concerns of, of the countries and the second caveat is that uh, although in many cases there are great expectations about the contributions that foreign direct investments can make in terms of uh, furthering development objectives of a particular country, in many cases these expectations are not met by reality. In many cases uh, technology is not brought, so there is no sufficient diffusion or training of local personnel and often the uh, royalty payments, profits that are sent abroad and importation of parts components in the end exceed what has been brought into the country in terms of capital investment and therefore not necessarily uh, foreign direct investment has the positive impact that uh, countries are expecting uh, from these policies. So that's why it's so important to have the right policy as, as uh, Monte has mentioned the fact that uh, what is important is to get quality investment and not just any kind of investment. And for that, countries must retain some policy space in order to be able to accept those investments which are suitable to their needs and, and development goals, and also to take measures in order to ensure that these investments produce the, the, the side benefits, for instance, what we call, and there's a chapter in this book about this, what we call performance requirements. That means that there should be some obligations imposed on the investor in terms of training, transfer of technology, local content, which is so important in order to promote uh, local industrialization. But then what, what has happened is that in order to promote foreign direct investment, many countries follow the approach of signing bilateral agreements um, for the protection of foreign investors. So we call these bilateral investment treaties, BITS, the acronym is BITS, and especially since the 90s, a large number of BITS were signed, in some cases between developed countries uh, themselves, between developed and developing countries, and today in accordance with, with the ANCTAD report, for instance, there are about 3,000 BITS in force. In addition to this, in uh, free trade agreements starting from NAFTA, the it has been a common practice for developed countries that promote free trade agreements to include a chapter on investment protection. So, so now that free trade agreements for instance signed between the United States and Chile, Colombia, Peru, 
the, the, the TPP agreement, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, they all include a chapter on investment. So these bits have also evolved into particular components of free trade agreements, which makes, uh, as we will see, um, policy making even, even more difficult because it is uh, eventually uh, more complicated to withdraw from a full free trade agreement when investment and investment chapter is, is there. But why this, if these investment agreements have become problematic? Well, the reason is because this, this agreement contains a number of provisions that essentially aim at protecting investors' interest. And in general, there is very little to protect the state's interest in them. So for instance, in these agreements, you find the national treatment clause. That means that foreigners should be treated uh, at the same level as nationals. You get the most favored nation clause. That means that if an investor finds that in another agreement uh, made by the particular country, there are conditions which are more favorable than those apply applicable under the agreement with his own country, this condition may be invoked. So the investor may always invoke the best, the best conditions which were granted to an investor by a particular country through other agreements. One, one particular, one is real problem in, in these bids is that uh, the, the standard of protection is based on a, billion, on, on a very ambiguous concept of fair and equitable treatment. So this original, this concept uh, alluded to situations where there were, there were egregious violations to international law. The way in which this standard of fair and equitable treatment has been interpreted by, uh, by tribunals, uh, by arbitration tribunals, has expanded the concept in such a way that any change of policy of a government may be the ground for an investor to, uh, to claim that this treatment has been violated. For instance, changes in environmental policies. If a country decides that a certain standard for environmental protection has to be increased, so this may be seen by an investor as something that violates this fair and equitable treatment. If there is a, a, an increase in taxes, this could be also a reason for that. If the investor loses some shares in, in the market or some state action, this could be the reason for, for a complaint. So the fact is that the standards for protection are so ambiguous and so broad that this has give, given, given rise to uh, a number of complaints based on just the, the exercise of, poly, of a state policy to protect public interest. Uh, this is, this is linked also to the fact that in these agreements there is a vague concept of indirect expropriation. There is not only expropriation which should be compensated, but these agreements include in general a vague concept of indirect expropriation. That means that any, any action that may, may deprive from, from value the assets of, uh, of a particular investor could also be the ground for an, uh, a complaint. Well, just to, uh, just to be short, the outcome of these, of, of these, pro of these provisions in, in the bids uh, were the basis for uh, a large number of complaints by foreign investors that could benefit from the specific protection of this agreement. Um, today, for instance, uh, there are more than 600 complaints which are already uh, recorded. There has been a, a significant increase of complaints after year 2000. Because the foreign investor discovered, or the lawyers discovered, discovered that they could claim, uh, in, in, in some cases, extraordinary compensations for just changes in policies of uh, particular countries. As the, uh, and the book that we are presented here, as you will see, uh, shows some of the cases where this has, um, this has happened. So, uh, what's, the, what's the main problem then with this? Uh, with these agreements, um, the main problem is that they limit uh, policy space, that they do not allow the states to follow policies that are necessary to uh, further certain public interest, uh, certain public interest, that at any time any action by the state may be judged by a foreign investor as something which is uh, violating the principles. If, for instance, a foreign investor has, has has received a concession for electricity power supply, 
and uh, the company is not complying with the conditions under which a contract has been signed. It has often led to a complaint by the foreign investor that his, uh, his rights have been, have been violated. Uh, therefore, uh, the, the problem is that countries that signed this type of, con of, of, of uh, agreements at one point uh, considered that this was too much and there was a need to take action. And then there has been a reaction coming from a number of countries which are, which are signatories of these agreements. Some, some countries just decided to terminate this agreement, to withdraw from the system. Bolivia, Ecuador, where we hear about the case of Indonesia, South Africa, they decided that it was too much, they, they were subject to a significant complaints. For instance, in the case of Argentina, my own country, by the way, complaints reach uh, more than 50 billion US dollars. Uh, Ecuador is also a case of point of, uh, of complaints of uh, multi, multi, million, multi million complaints by foreign investors. But just uh, for cases where the foreign investors were not complying with national laws and with the obligations under the contracts. In the case of Canada, just to give you another example, the course in Canada revoked two patents granted to Eli Lilly, a pharmaceutical, an American pharmaceutical company, on the grounds of uh, th that the patents were not, the inventions were not actually complying with the, with the requirements of patentability. And this is, of course, uh, something that any state has the right to decide whether a patent is valid or not. There was a decision by the Supreme Court of, of Canada, but then the investor considered that this was a violation of the rights, and then they sued Canada for 500 million US dollars. So this is the kind of abuses of the system, uh, which is further complicated by the fact that who takes the decision about whether there has been a violation or not? So this agreement introduced a clause in accordance to which the investor can sue directly the state. So this is the investor state litigation, direct direct possibility. And uh, this uh, litigation takes place on the basis of arbitration. So a tribunal is, is set up, uh, it could be under the convention of, which is administered by the World Bank and under ANSI rules or, or other systems. But in the end, the decision about whether a policy adopted by a country was correct or not, or was violating or not the investor rights is taken by three private arbitrators who may overrule a decision by a Supreme Court, as it is the case, for instance, now with Canada, or the case in India, in which uh, a major claim, a major complaint, is made in connection with a decision taken by the Supreme Court of India. Then a system is created uh, on the basis of which the, there is a, a, a jurisdiction outside the national jurisdiction, which is, which, which is not subject to any rules, particular rules is, is that the decision is made on international principles of law. There is no appeal and therefore all any measure that is taken by, by national governments that may in some way or another be considered to be an indirect appropriation or violation of this ambiguous fair and equitable treatment can be the subject of a, a, a complaint and led to very significant awards, very significant compensation, which are imposed on the developing countries. So as I mentioned then, some countries started to react, and this is the case, as I mentioned, of Ecuador, uh, of Bolivia, of Indonesia, of South Africa, Argentina is also considering uh, what to do. Some countries have decided to develop their own models of, uh, of uh, investment agreements, as uh, Manuel Monte has mentioned, Brazil is one case in point. Brazil, in fact, uh, as far as we know, signed 14 bits, 14 bilateral investment treaties, but the parliament in Brazil was wise enough not to ratify them, and therefore Brazil has been free from this problem. In Argentina, for instance, 58 bits were adopted, and that's why Argentina is the country with the highest number of complaints based on these, on these bits. Well, then this book is about this story. This book is about the story of the bits. The, the, is about the proliferation of bits 
and how these agreements have been used in order to uh, attack measures that are adopted by sovereign states in order to pursue um, uh, public interest in, in different areas, environment, taxation, um, patent policy, whatever. Then you will find in the book um, a first chapter by Martin Cole, the executive director of the, of the South Center, who uh, summarizes the problems with the, with the bids, uh, the, the, the clauses have described, why these clauses are problematic, and why the, the system is, is used in a manner which is the, not the proper one. For instance, one element that uh, Martin uh, mentions here is the fact that the arbitrators, uh, in, in, in 15 arbitrators, have been involved in a large number of the cases of so the same the same the same lawyers are are taking decisions on a large number of the cases and in many in a many situations these same arbitrators are counselors to the companies that are suing the government or are members of the boards of the company. So there is a situation where there is no control about conflict of interest whatsoever. And there is a system that is corrupt, uh, if I could say in this way, and that leads to uh, decisions that may uh, create major, major economic problems for uh, for developing countries. So this is described in the first chapter by by Martin Cole. The sector, second chapter by Mass Accuse, um, the, the paper by Irma has already been mentioned by Manuel Montes. So there is a reference about the role of foreign direct investment and, and the myth about the positive benefits that automatically uh, foreign direct investment may bring, and this is what some people think uh, in a wrong way. So it, it must brings uh, some uh, evidence about what, what is really the impact of foreign direct investment and the fact that in many cases the expectations that uh, are created are not uh, actually made. It's a chapter by myself on the case of, uh, of the, Canada, this is the revocation of patents by the Supreme Court of Canada, which has been challenged by the, by the company, arguing that there is no right by the government of Canada and the courts to consider that their patents are uh, invalid. There is a chapter by Manuel Montes and our uh, the colleague Kinda Mohamed on performance requirements. As I mentioned before, this is very important in order to ensure the quality of an investment. When an investor is accepted, the government should set some rules, in, for instance, in terms of local content, or in terms of what should be imported or exported. And the, these bids, these bilateral in, investment treaties, and the chapters in the, in the free trade agreements just, just prohibit these performance requirements. That means that the investor is just free to do whatever his own economic rationale will lead uh, him to do. Without, without taking care of the uh, national conditions of the, of the national of the national policies. So this is an examined in this chapter. Uh, this another, the following chapter is about the dispute settlement mechanism and how this should be changed or improved because, uh, as I just mentioned, it's not working in a proper or even honest manner uh, or fair manner uh, for both parties, for the investors and the states. Uh, there is a chapter uh, which is very interesting indeed on gender issues and uh, liberalization reform. And the second part of, of, the, of the book contains uh, national experiences. Uh, so this, this, this part of the book includes uh, lessons uh, that we are learning from different countries. Uh, there is a first chapter on the case of South Africa, as I mentioned, is one of the countries that decided to react against this situation. The second chapter on uh, Ecuador's experience, which uh, Ecuador is really, really promoting an action also at the, at the, at the level of UNASUR in order to create um, a court, a regional court, to take care of these cases of investment disputes. And also, Ecuador is, is uh, promoting the creation of an observatory to look at the conduct of enterprises and prevent this, uh, this type of litigation to take take place. Uh, there is um, another chapter on the case of India and as you will see here there is a, a good example of a complaint of a challenge of decision by the highest court in the country uh, that will be decided in the end by a small group of arbitrators outside any jurisdiction. And 
uh, who would apply the international uh, law in general without any possibility of appeal. Uh, there is um, uh, a chapter on Argentina, uh, one of the suffering countries in this context, uh, very much suffering, uh, the large number of cases against, and uh, some of them settled, some of them, of them still pending, so it's been a very, very heavy burden on Argentina. And finally, there is a chapter on Indonesia, and we have here the author, so the idea is not need for me to make a reference to that. So this is the content of the book. It's really it's worth reading, and this perhaps could alert um, some policy makers about the threats of these uh, agreements, either um, whether in cases where, where they are just on investment or whether they are part of treated agreements as it is uh, now normally in the case. Thank you very much. Well, we, we have also we have also our <laughs> our friends of Isaac. I, I ask if you wish to say something about them. No, not by now. Thank you. Okay. So I, I, I once more I want to express our uh, proud in being chosen by South Center for the launching of this book, that, which will have, uh, will, will certainly will have a major role in the discussion of this important, very important problem of the, the treaties, the investment treaties. And I, I, I regret very much, but I, I have a, an emergency problem at home. So, yes, yeah, I, uh, but uh, I, I, I leave you with, my, with uh, my, our friends of Luis Carlos Prado, who was former president, director president of the, of the center, and Carlos Medeiros is also a brilliant uh, associate to, to our institutes. So I, I demand excuse you, but I, I have to. I'm uh, very grateful, uh, Professor. I will, I will go and then check. Okay. Professor uh, Prado, uh, you give the comments. And, uh, Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you here. It is a very interesting book. Um, uh, it's largely a, a knowledge that uh, foreign investment has generally positive effects on development. Uh, uh, but developed countries has also learned that for several reasons, uh, it's, uh, uh, oh, uh, this is not always true. There is a lot of occasions that foreign investment has uh, difficult and problematic effects uh, to developed countries. For example, it's not uncommon uh, to see foreign uh, for, uh, firms, international companies, particularly in relationship to less developed countries, uh, apply uh, in host countries practices on business policies uh, that they would not dare to use in their countries of origin. This is particularly true in environment issues, in work, in labor projects, in the health uh, issues as well. Uh, but host countries has also the right uh, to limit foreign investments to the reasons of industrial policies and uh, uh, due to the need to develop domestic technology, of course. Uh, for example, restriction in foreign investment has been successful use, as has already said for Dr. Carlos Correa in the uh, uh, Korean industrialization and also in Japanese industrialization. Both countries are true. 
So developed countries have the right in the, in, in the due of subject foreign investment to their interests, not the, the way you are, uh, uh, not the, the opposite. Uh, the idea that developed countries should subordinate the domestic interests for the sake uh, to keep profit of international firms to attract foreign investments is a complete reversion of the value and priorities of a aligned society. Uh, this is a very simple fact uh, that has been frequently forget by critical support uh, given by the media in developed and developing countries. Uh, uh, I emphasize that because recently Brazilian press has made a gloom prediction about the future of Brazil foreign trades and uh, our country capacity to attract foreign investment to the simple fact that Brazil was out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, some papers have even arised the example of the frustrated attempt of the creation of uh, uh, IFTA, America Free Trade Area, what we call AUCA, in the 90s, uh, that they consider a missed opportunity uh, for Brazil. Uh, those uh, who uh, oppose, I had uh, talked to some of these journalists, uh, they call uh, that they are out of fashion because they are protectionist. Mm -hmm. uh, for this reason, I, I strongly welcome the publication of the book. Uh, this is very, uh, uh, particularly this moment in Brazil, uh, this book is an important contribution to the debate about the risk and the cost of investment trade trades. Uh, as you have already said, what Brazil has done is a good thing not miss opportunities, how they usually say. <laughs> Brazil is among the countries that receive more uh, international investment. There's no problem at all to receive it. Uh, well, can receive a little bit more or less, doesn't matter, but uh, we have no problem at all. But uh, when you read some of these pundits or, uh, in newspaper for the broad public, and uh, the idea is that you are missing a lot of opportunities because you are not uh, you are not keeping uh, signing uh, the current treaties. Not only Brazil, but Brazil, Argentina, and all the Mercosul, because uh, you uh, refuse to enter in this kind of agreements. It's not an easy fight, particularly in, in, in that moment. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, uh, it, I think that it's interesting to uh, give this book not only for us, but try to distribute them. is a pity that uh, uh, has read uh, out uh, our president because he was a, a, a member of the Senate for many years. Mm -hmm. You have to give this to the Senate of Brazil because uh, they are the one that signed, that uh, uh, has the right uh, to uh, uh, approve the, the, the treaties in Brazil. So, uh, um, uh, the, the book is quite interesting. I have read uh, the, the papers uh, with a lot of interest. Uh, who, the summer made by Martin Koch, uh, the public concern on investment treaties, it's quite acute, it's very, very uh, well uh, written. Uh, it's particularly worries the fact that a small group of lower firms whose interests are very far for any war with developed issues or welfare of developing uh, countries' population have de facto uh, monopoly uh, monop of the seats in the uh, arbitration tribunals. Uh, as you have said, uh, said uh, Dr. Carlos Corrêa, uh, how is it possible some uh, lower firms uh, members uh, overrule the decision of Supreme Courts? This is, uh, 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 this is similar to some clause of the uh, unequal treaties of the 19th century that imposed on Asian countries or Latin American countries uh, in the old times of the old imperialism. Uh, 
it's not possible to have extra territorial, uh, uh, territorials. That is, that the laws of the country doesn't apply for international firms. Simply, it's not possible. So, uh, uh, the article of the, uh, Dr. Ilman's articles uh, is quite interesting as well, has made a useful synthesis of the myths and reality of the foreign direct investment agreements. The author is well known by Brazilian economists for his important contribution in the debate on trade and development. Uh, and um, um, there's a, a lot of other uh, interesting uh, chapter. Uh, it's not the case of a uh, goal goals uh, to analyze each one of them. And uh, uh, what I have to say is this, I, I think that it's better you keep on uh, in the debate. And uh, uh, the, the point that was made, in the example of specific countries that uh, have already signed this particular uh, welcome, because uh, the only thing that uh, is always said in Brazil is that you are lose opportunities. This uh, is proof that you are as well gain uh, for not have to pay uh, for international firms for decision of policies. Uh, uh, and uh, a point that I, I would like to make is that what is interesting is that domestic the large firms has not the same rights of international firms in this case. They have to abide by the domestic laws. So the international firms have not to abide by the domestic laws. It's quite strange. Uh, okay, I, uh, I have, uh, I think, again, uh, that is a wonderful book. I strongly recommend to the people that uh, did not have uh, opportunity to read the papers before, and uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to debate them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Prado. Uh, we are very happy that you have uh, given your comments. Uh, we are one of the things that we struck us about the effort in Brazil is that uh, the the parliament is not approving the treaties that the executive branch of Signed, right? And one of the Brazilians explained to us is because the parliament is the argument that it violates some of the constitutional provisions yes. of Brazil. Right? Uh, so uh, unfortunately for many countries this is not true. Uh, but you have also brought up the fact that in the case of uh, these treaties, the domestic investors have, have less protections than the foreign investors. So this is, uh, thank you very much. So now I would like to call on uh, Professor Medeiros to, uh, uh, to give his comments. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I don't have a lot to say, just to agree with my friend here, Prado, that this is an excellent book. And it's a good opportunity now to, to discuss this, this theme by the South Center, because uh, I think that uh, uh, we are living in a circumstance, an international circumstance, that we have a large offensive of the United States uh, and impose a lot of treatment and agreements with uh, undeveloped countries just to make an area to enlarge the competition of the United States against China. And I think that uh, this is uh, a very important thing because uh, a lot of a frustration occur in Doha uh, agreement uh, because a lot of uh, 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 agreements with uh, uh, intellectual property did not come very well uh, according to the interest of United States and rich countries. And so that the treaties and a lot of multilateral uh, treatment as this transatlantic and, uh, or, or transpacific partnership has to do much more with this property, uh, intellectual property and control of technology and uh, even to 
to limit the space of the states to act to protect their uh, national production or national strategy and all that. I think that uh, after the 90s, uh, uh, we saw different kinds of answer to the pressure of the uh, United States. One we call uh, as this, um, an, um, an opening uh, without any kind of strategy, and the other was a kind of resistance. And uh, of course, China, you know, this is a kind of uh, resistant, resistant answer to depression. And so, uh, I think that um, this kind of treatment, uh, this uh, um, bilateral uh, investment treaties now, has to uh, is uh, is trying to. Um, to oppose this kind of resistance that many countries put uh, in investment and uh, in their policies. And I think that this is, uh, is interesting, interesting to think, that uh, in the old tradition of about multinational and transnational cooperation, that uh, I remember very, very much that's uh, brilliant paper by Stephen Heimer, the idea that a multinational cooperation was not to spread technical progress, and uh, but it's, it's a form to control property. It's a form to control a foreign, a foreign asset uh, by um, the innovators, by the, by the companies. And so, I, but I, as a matter of fact, uh, a lot of countries um, um, discover a way to benefit from this kind of uh, uh, technical progress from, from multinational cooperation. And now, I think that the, the, the transnational cooperation are trying to limit this possibility to, um, um, for the countries to benefit more for the technical progress that they have. And so I think that uh, um, one very important thing that I read, one paper of, of uh, in this book, but I don't remember now. But it was a really interesting uh, question about uh, what is investment, after all? Because uh, uh, the idea that people have of investment or foreign investment is uh, so limited parts of a green field, green field investment, but uh, um, the idea of investment that has to be protected is something that uh, involves any kind of uh, property relation that are uh, uh, connected uh, uh, non-citizens to, uh, to other countries. And so um, this is, is, is a point that uh, uh, it's interesting for us to think about because uh, what is the purpose uh, to guarantee to establish an uh, um, agreement uh, for investment, uh, given the investment uh, so broad and in a specific uh, definition. And the other thing that uh, I think this is, is, is important is to realize that uh, this is a kind of a relation between um, developed and underdeveloped countries, because uh, I don't see a lot of, of um, this kind of bits uh, among uh, developed countries. This is, 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 is particularly something that you have to um, um, generalize a standard of uh, property law for the, the international capital um, against uh, some idiosyncratic uh, laws that the developing countries have. And so this is, is kind of a globalization. This is, is other, other thing of uh, uh, globalization in norms, in patterns, in institutions. Uh, it's not only globalization in things and, uh, or technology and all that. So I think that this, this is really really interesting book and uh, explains some, some aspects that I, I, I consider really important. So this is. Thank you very much, Professor Madeiros. Uh, so now we will open up to the discussion, but I'd like to give uh, uh, Mr. Jailani a very important comment. He is getting uh, very excited about this discussion. Uh, our Brazilian friends are particularly uh, uh, interested about TPP and, and this, but not as TPP itself, right? But as a way in which the United States is trying to change the rules uh, and trying to dominate the, uh, the discussion. In the case of uh, Professor Madero's just recent comment is that uh, 
I, I, I take the impression that it's a matter of making sure that the rules are consistent with what the developed countries want to impose on, on developing countries. So please, uh, Thank you, Mr. Manuel. I think um, I make this comment just for the purpose of soliciting very enthusiastic discussion later, because I'm really inclined to your points. Previously, you said that uh, did Brazil miss the opportunity because Brazil did not ratify some BIDs or do not make another BIDs or now some reluctance to join the TDP. My personal response, my prompt response is no. Brazil does not miss the, report, the opportunity. I think the, I'm, I'm saying this because to me it was right decision. And I even personally think that Brazil now is the better footing than other countries who have many BITs. Mr. Carlos earlier said that there are many myths. There are superstitious belief <laughs> behind <laughs> BITs. I'm saying this, extremely saying that this is superstitious belief as if having BIT, it will increase the FDI. I just want to share you um, statistically, statistical evidence. Brazil, there is no any single treaties binds Brazil. And I compare with Indonesia, we have around 65 BITs. And if we compare FDI Brazil and Indonesia, I think you are number seven, if I'm not mistaken. Number five. And now Indonesia number 19. <laughs> so there must be something else. And I just want to give you another example. Egypt. They have already concluded more than 100, if I'm not mistaken. And ratified around 17. I don't know exactly how the level of FTR. So I think this fact is so important. So that's why I'm stressing this is not, uh, Brazil does not miss opportunity. It was right decision. And um, I think this idea has been perfectly captured in this book. I, I, I fully agree with you that one of the main purpose of this book is to debunk the superstitious belief around this book. I thank you. Thank you. Superstitious belief. So I would like to open the, uh, the discussion uh, to, uh, to, to questions. Or, uh, uh, Mr. Kifoni, if you would please yes. uh, give your comment. Hi there. Um, we are here representing the South American Institute of Government and Health, uh, which is part of UNISUR. And I would like to ask um, about um, health-related issues on the investment treaties. We have knowledge of the case of Uruguay, which has been sued by Philip Morris on the grounds that um, the laws protecting um, <coughs> the citizens from uh, tobacco use would be would represent less profits to Philip Morris. We also heard of a case in Argentina related to water, uh, in which the, co the uh, a company called Aguas Argentinas, which, uh, which uh, increased the prices, the price of water in 300% uh, or something like that, and the government froze the the prices of water to protect the, the citizens during the times of crisis were also sued on the grounds of less, of less profit. So I'd like to ask you for a comment on this. Maybe uh, if you're willing, Carlos, you could give the comment, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, well, thank you for the question. Well, there are no limits uh, under the bid. Any, any uh, national policy can be challenged, including public health, as, as you have just uh, correctly mentioned. Uh, the case of Uruguay and also Australia are good examples. In both countries, uh, anti-tobacco uh, policy has been introduced, uh, the plain packaging policy. In the case of Uruguay, uh, the measure uh, that was uh, challenged is because the, uh, the size of the, of the photographs 
which show the, the negative impact of smoking has been increased up to 80 percent and also there are some limitations in the way in which the trademark has, can be indicated as it is also the case in Australia. And then uh, Philip Morris using different uh, bits, using different bilateral investment treaties argued that this is a violation of the uh, fair and equitable treatment and there is uh, indirect expropriation of the trademarks because they cannot use, for instance, the figurative trademarks because there, there have been uh, studies indicated that the figurative uh, trademarks just uh, constitute an additional attraction to the consumer and the aim of the policies is to reduce uh, tobacco consumption. Interestingly, in the case of the um, uruguay switzerland uh, bilateral investment treaty on which Philip Morris has based its complaint against Uruguay, it is explicitly said that measures adopted in order to um, pursue public health objectives are not subject to the treaty. So there is, a, there is an exception for public health. Then Uruguay, the first submission that made to the tribunal, argued that there was no jurisdiction at the tribunal because this issue was outside the treaty itself. But the, our famous arbitrators, they consider that they have the right to give a decision on this case. They consider that they have jurisdiction despite the fact that the exception has been provided for. And this is one, one uh, outrageous example of the way in which uh, these treaties are interpreted in an expensive manner uh, in favor of the investors in most cases. And therefore, if a treaty like this is signed, you must be sure that you carve out this exception in such a manner that it, there is no ambiguity at all, and therefore that it is very clear that some areas are out of the uh, scope of the, of, the, of, of the treaty. For instance, we have just heard the forum that uh, uh, concluded yesterday that um, there is an initiative by African countries to develop a pan-African model of investment treaty where they will exclude areas such as environment, safety and public health. But still this may not be a sufficient defense if in the end you have an arbitration where it is uh, considered that uh, the investor rights are, are above any type of, uh, of exception that could be provided for. So there is no limitation and the, this is one one issue that uh, is important to consider. Uh, certainly, in, in the case of, of Philip Morris, I think that the company is also behind the um, uh, complaints that a number of countries, uh, initially Ukraine and then some other Latin American countries, have made in WTO, also against Australia, arguing that there is a violation of the WTO rules, in particular trade agreement, because of this limitation of the use of trademark. So interestingly, in this case, the, the company is using uh, different strategies, uh, not only the investment agreements, but also the WTO rules in order to stop the implementation of uh, clearly public health uh, justified measures. Did you say a small comment about that. Uh, this kind of decision act is a treaty on democracy because yeah. Uh, the, the government, yes. uh, uh, yes. uh, the society has the right uh, to uh, elect uh, the parliament and take decisions in relationship to the population. Yeah. When you say that someone uh, above the states, that there is no uh, uh, any kind of responsibility, no one uh, who can in the end uh, 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 impose a limit mm -hmm. that uh, are not elect, uh, have no uh, a career as judge. Uh, what kind of right they have? They have they are paid for some kind of business. Uh, according to the book, it's quite interesting. They can be in the two sides uh, of the. Uh, uh, the decision as lawyers and as the judge. Uh, those who are judge cannot uh, act uh, as lawyer in any part of the world. 
it's not possible. Uh, if you have in two position is someone that can hire you in the future, uh, you are in a position uh, when uh, your interest, I suggest, is not, uh, uh, is, can uh, eventually be biased by, uh, by your future interest. This is simply not acceptable. Please, uh, Graciela, please introduce yourself. Sorry, my name is Graciela Rodriguez. I am from Reprip. Um, this is network of cyber society network on integration in Latin America and then about trade and other issues and investment too. Sorry, my English is very bad, uh, but I, I try to, 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 to talk because I, I, I like to talk about this, I'd rather say. Uh, we have a, in, in this moment one effort to put together, to join uh, the, the discussion on TPIs or uh, investment agreement and uh, WTO rules too, with the global uh, corporation power. Because the problem is, it's not possible to have a discussion about only investment agreement. We need to put the, 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 the power to put this in, 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 in action. We have two examples for us now. In, in Ecuador, you say they have the, the commission, the Auditoria for the TPIs, and they, they part of the civil society, our uh, partners in Ecuador, have, or the other countries, have part of this commission, the CAITISA, but they have a, a, a real a, a form, a final um, uh, declaration and formal study, but it's impossible to put up uh, public because they uh, put uh, in, in question the, 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 the global corporation in Ecuador to have uh, to, and the government is in this moment to request to put in, uh, to, to divulgate, to put in public these results. And in Brazil, for example, the, the new style of investment treatment and agreements in, in now we have four agreements in this moment with Colombia, uh, Mexico, Angola, oh, Mozambique. Yeah. And we have in the new trade agreement, um, the new investment agreement. In, in, in this case, what is the, the, the reason for to create this new uh, agreement? Because the transnational companies from Brazil like this, it not only or say, Brazil don't have a, a trade uh, investment agreement, but when they, their own companies go out at uh, Africa and Latin America, the trans Latinas, or they like the the um, uh, investment agreement, Brazilian investment agreement, are better <laughs> or more not. Um, State uh, investor state uh, uh, clause, but oh no, it's, it's, it's better, but it's in investment agreement. We need now investment agreement because the national uh, uh, companies they like one, one don't question this problem, no, but they like the same. The government say we we are preparing now one uh, book in this uh, agreement in Brazil agreement. We have recently one seminar with the government and um, many other people in Latin America to try these cases, and we prepare one book, small book, for our contribution in the analysis of this um, Brazilian agreement in investment. Do you have other comments here? Uh, Robert, did you want to make a comment? No. Oh, may I ask another question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, just uh, another question. We were talking here about the, the system that's being uh, created in, in Unisur, uh, maybe to replace as an alternative exactly. to, the, to the UN 
Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what is it? Yes. Sorry. And I would like to ask you about if this is an alternative, what are the opportunities or the threats to this kind of system? If I may take out uh, even the, the previous question. And the first question with, uh, with respect to uh, whether the, the potential cases against say zombie to health or environment, I agree with you that with Ka Mr. Carlos that it is unlimited possibilities. For Indonesia, if I may share with you, uh, it's not, we never have a, a case with respect to health so far. But we have a problem with environmental issues. And I gave one example that there is a new law in our country that restrict uh, the export uh, uh, the exporter for mi mineral and coal. And this policy, this is under our legislative acts, was challenged. But luckily, we can settle it out of the court. But it was we had a case, and the same case is. I just want to show you how the system can threaten democracy. We have a law on water resources. And there was a file against this law to our constitutional court. And according to our constitution, that the ownerships, foreign ownerships uh, to companies uh, on our natural resource, water, water resources is not allowed. So only for domestic investors. And there was an obligation to, to divest. And this is the decision of constitutional court. Luckily until today is not, there's no challenge, but I can tell there will be a challenge once the government give effect to this court decision. But this is one example that I'm, 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 I'm trying to show in this opportunity. Now allow me to tackle your uh, second question on to replace our alternative. Maybe Mr. Carlos can talk further on this issue. I just want to highlight one aspect. It is true that we might consider to, to replace or to find alternative to this uh, Exit. Exit. But one thing we should bear in mind, this is not the only problem. Incident problem is only half of the problem. There is another half. The substantive provision of the BIT itself. We should not forget, even this case would be settled in national court if the treaty provision is not good. You know our national court, they have to enact law, so it's not good still. So the issue is not only about where it should be addressed. It's only half the problem, but the another half problem is the substantive provision. It is so essential, I think. Thank you. Well, this is, a, this is an interesting alternative, um, but of course it's not a full uh, solution to the problem. Uh, to the extent that uh, these BITs are still in force. That's why some countries have uh, just decided to pull out from them, just decided to terminate them. This is the, this is the right solution. This is the only solution in fact. Uh, however, one problem with these treaties is that in many cases they contain what is called a survival clause. That means that even after termination, the investors may invoke the clauses for a period of uh, 10 years, 15 years, whatever the agreement would have established. And this is one of the issues that uh, countries have been uh, trying to, uh, to address, how to uh, deal with this survival period. Uh, in, well, in one case, uh, and there had, it has been possible to, uh, to solve this problem, in precisely the, uh, the agreement between Indonesia and Argentina that perhaps you, you may tell us about. But of course, if the, um, the other party, uh, the other uh, contracting party is not willing to get an agreement, the survival clause will apply. 
So therefore, the, the right, the real, the, the real solution is to pull out from these agreements uh, when they terminate, not to uh, renew them. So be very conscious that there might be automatic renewal. So it's important to uh, to monitor what the situation is, avoid the, re the automatic renewal, to denounce the treaties in a, in, a, in a timely manner, and not to let, not to enter into new treaties of this kind, uh, because as it was said, they do not attract foreign direct investment. There is no evidence at all that there is a, a, an association between signing these treaties and an increased foreign direct investment flow. As this is clear, the case of, of Brazil and, and other countries. So some countries have a, a large number of, F, of treaties of this kind, but no FDI is taking place. Um, so this is the, the, the way in which this, this scenario may be cleaned up. And then um, the, the real alternative is to have national laws to deal with uh, foreign direct investors, as it was in the past, as it was in the 90s, the, in particular, many countries, especially in Latin America, adopted the foreign direct investment laws that established uh, when a foreign direct, direct investment was acceptable or not, under which conditions, how remittances of profits and capital could be made, so on and so forth. And this, this also meant that any, any, any conflict was subject to national laws and, and courts. And perhaps this is the, the long-term solution that uh, developing countries should look at. Yes. I want to answer? National or regional? Because, for example, in Latin America, in South America especially, we have Mercosur, we have uh, UNASUR. We need to put more in common these policies. It's not possible to, to go national level. Uh, Brazil. <laughs> The problem is not that the solution is not national. I think we need, we think the solution is, is regional for to change for for, for, for power to to change. Né? And for example, UNASUR will be one opportunity to to create uh, role, roles for uh, investment the countries, not uh, not. Sorry, Manuel. No competir al abismo, uh, competir uh, in, in together. Uh, I think, but it's difficult. This. <laughs> no, no. It, uh, the, the problem is that uh, many of the institutions globally uh, force uh, societies to compete with each other, right? Uh, instead of for the private sector to compete among themselves, right? So, what has happened is that they have now inverted the whole idea of capitalism. Well, to be have societies competing with each other for the foreign investment and to lower the regulations, and then to have a legal system that will enforce uh, enforce this through the bilateral investment treaties. We actually have. Uh, uh, if there are no, no comments, there is a, we have some refreshments that we would like to, with the help of uh, uh, Fortado that is uh, assisting us. Uh, and if there is no other uh, comments, we could uh, end the the formal uh, sit-down discussion now, and we would very much like to invite you to the uh, to the refreshments. Uh, there no other questions uh, or comments? I, I would just like to make a few uh, ending remarks, right? Uh, that, uh, first of all, again, we would like to express our deep thanks to uh, uh, Celso Portado uh, Center for uh, hosting this uh, meeting. As I said, this is the first uh, launch of this book, which are very, we are very quite uh, proud of. Secondly, I would like to say that uh, we do hope that in the long run we can continue to work with the Celso Portado Institute. Uh, thirdly, I'd like to thank the uh, presenters and the uh, commentators uh, that have that spoken today, Mr. Tolani, Mr. Professor Madero, Professor uh, Prado, and we would like to hope that uh, in the future we can continue to work uh, together with you. So, uh, thank you very much. Yes.